Thank you to the organizers for this opportunity. The title of my talk today is HIV Related Implementation Research for Key Populations, Designing for Individuals, Evaluating Across Populations, and Integrating Context. I have no disclosures. At this stage of the epidemic, we have a pretty good sense of what to do to prevent and treat HIV. But increasingly, we're asking ourselves, how do we do that best? And this is particularly relevant for those who are most marginalized, such as key populations. Where should services be implemented? At facilities, within the community, by whom, uh, when, for what duration, how frequently, what should the dosage look like, and what should the delivery mechanisms be? And how do we integrate context? So what does it mean to design for individuals and take context into account? I'll give you one example from work that our team has done applying the Consolidated Framework for Implementation uh, Research to key populations. So the CIFR broadly has five uh, domains, the outer setting, the inner setting, characteristics of individuals, intervention characteristics, and implementation and research processes. Each of these has multiple uh, constructs within them. And we applied, we identified the constructs that seemed most relevant for key populations and really tried to think through how those might provide facilitators or barriers to implementation success. And I'll just pull out a few examples for you um, to make it a little bit more specific. So for example, in the outer setting, criminalization um, of sex work activities, for example, or same-sex behaviors um, may impact who ends up participating in a service that you're offering or in a research study. And those selection biases or impacts on retention may ultimately affect the results and your understanding of the results. In terms of the inner setting, uh, organizational culture of the implementing partner, community representation from key populations and their leadership in the organization um, will have implications for, again, selection biases based on trust, but also organizational culture will affect turnover within an organization and potentially the fidelity of implementation. In terms of characteristics of individuals, uh, knowledge and beliefs of the key populations and their self-efficacy um, to promote or achieve a certain change um, will have implications for uptake of services and engagement in interventions. In terms of intervention characteristics, particularly important for key populations might be the intervention source. Did this intervention come from the needs and priorities of, of the population that's being served, the key population, or did it come externally? Uh, what is adapt to, uh, how adaptable uh, is the intervention and how complex? And again, this will affect uptake, appropriateness, and fidelity. Keeping in mind that uh, the greater complexity of an intervention, uh, you may have less fidelity. In terms of processes, engagement, planning, and execution, how are key populations uh, incorporated into each of those phases of research or implementation? And again, this will affect uh, representation. In terms of thinking about evaluating across populations, you know, when you are implementing a program with key populations or thinking about a research study, you have a, a sample that you're working with, but you also have individuals that um, may have been eligible and chose not to participate. How are those individuals different? Also, who wasn't eligible to participate? How are those individuals different? And who is the population that ultimately you want your results to uh, apply to, your target population? And increasingly with implementation science research, we want our sample population to look ever more closely like our target population. And the greater that the difference is between our sample and our target population, perhaps the less generalizable our results will be. So how do we go from uh, designing for individuals to thinking about populations? Well, we have to recognize that there is a tension between tailored and person-centered services, which really are meant to adapt to the, the individual needs of, of populations, but also trying to achieve population impact and trying to implement interventions that will be scalable. We recognize that if we design for everyone, we are essentially designing for no one and aren't really meeting the heterogeneity of needs within a population, but also realizing that we're trying to understand how things can be feasibly brought to scale. Additionally, there's often an evidence hierarchy that really puts high value on efficacy and effectiveness studies and, and randomized control trials, 
and less emphasis on pra pragmatic research or real world data. And this may create problems when what we see in trials doesn't seem to actually work out in the real world once individuals are provided with options and may choose to take them up or not. So where feasible, uh, there's a push to use existing data and more rigorous methods to assess impact. And where data are not available, we should be increasingly thinking about how we can incorporate the key population community in the design, how we can, our design can allow for preference and adaptation, measuring implementation, and also considering mathematical modeling approaches as complementary sources of evidence generation. And just a few examples of how this might be done. This is work that our team is doing uh, in South Africa with female sex workers, aligned with the key population program implemented by TB HIV Care in South Africa. So they have a national program that's, that's implementing uh, sex worker ART and PrEP across multiple sites. And we've been able to partner with them in, in a variety of ways to really try and understand uh, implementation impact. So one example of that, <clears throat> is utilizing programmatic data from their national program to really compare implementation strategies over time and apply causal inference methods to try and understand their impact. In a different study that we're doing with TB HIV care, we're looking at an adaptive design. So we're co-located at a site in which services ART is being provided to female sex workers at a drop-in center, but then identifying those who are not virally suppressed and enrolling them in a study that's adaptive. So randomizing to one intervention, but then based on a woman's responsiveness, re-randomizing her to another intervention or set of interventions in order to, again, try and tailor the intervention to meet her needs while also trying to optimize efficiency. An additional study being conducted in these sites is looking at case management for women on PrEP. So offering everyone a base package, but then allowing women to choose uh, top-up approaches and the duration of services that they may want to receive. So again, incorporating preference into the design, evaluating what those choices are, and then assessing what the impact of those choices are. In terms of integrating context, uh, we know that the providers, organizations, and the legal context will all influence implementation. And we can think of these as exposures, but we can also think of them as effect measure modifiers. And so increasingly, we should be thinking about measuring these elements of context, the legal environment, engagements with the police, provider attitudes, and incorporating them either as the exposure of interest in our analyses, linking them to our um, treatment and prevention outcomes, or considering them as effect measure modifiers and really trying to understand how our implementation is impacted by these elements. So in closing, as we think about designing for individuals, uh, increasingly we realize that there's a need to tailor our approach, considering context in the design phase, just what we're doing is not enough, but really thinking about how we're going to do that and how we're going to tailor that to the population. Measuring implementation, often we measure acceptability, but also increasingly we recognize the need to measure appropriateness, adoption, and fidelity. Things may not work, and we often, if we don't measure it, we don't know if they didn't work because it wasn't implemented as planned, or if it was implemented as planned and that strategy just doesn't work. Evaluating across populations, we want to th be thinking about how we can leverage available program data and apply uh, rigorous methods to try and utilize that data efficiently. And where we cannot or need additional data, um, we should be planning studies that are adaptive, preference-driven, and pragmatic, and complementing work with modeling wherever possible. In terms of incorporating context, uh, really making sure at the anal analysis phase as well as the design phase, that what we're doing is context informed, considering context as a mediator and sometimes as a modifier in our analyses and considering who was and wasn't reached by our interventions and our implementation strategies and really allowing these to provide insights for generalizability and transportability. So I just wanna acknowledge um, our team at the Key Populations team at Johns Hopkins um, and collaborators at TBHAV Care, St. Michael's Hospital and Washington University in St. Louis and our funding from the National Institute of Health and INR and through NIAD. Thank you very much.